thank you, Pastor Michael and Leighton and Carla, for leading us in praising our God this day. Well, good morning, friends. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. If you don't have a Bible with you and you want to grab one of the pew Bibles there in front of you, we're on page 879. 879. If you are uh, just joining us this morning, we welcome you here. Uh, we hope you are encouraged by our worship and um, by, uh, by the teaching you'll receive today from the Word of God. And just to let you know, what we do here as a congregation is we work through whole books of the Bible at a time, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And we are getting close to concluding our study in Acts that we've been in for the last uh, roughly 18, uh, 18 months or so. So we want to invite you to, uh, to join us today as we uh, continue that study. If you brought a Bible with you and you're not quite sure where to find the book of Acts, uh, the easiest way to find it, if you open the Bible, go about two-thirds of the way through, you'll see those four biographies of, G of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Acts is right next door to John. <clears throat> so if you see John, Acts will be the next one uh, next door. And actually, the author of Acts is the same person that wrote the, uh, the Gospel of Luke. So Luke, the writer of Jesus' life, <clears throat> excuse me, life, death, and t uh, resurrection, um, continued on the story in the book of Acts. So think of Acts as Luke 2.0 uh, uh, to tell us what happened after Jesus is raised from the dead and after Jesus ascends back to the right hand of God. So in Acts, we get um, the picture of the early church being filled with God's Holy Spirit and then carrying on the mission that Jesus gave them to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the very ends of the earth. Now we're studying the book of Acts not because we're just interested in what happened you know, way back when, we're trying to understand what God is doing even now. So as we study what happened 2,000 years ago, we're also realizing that the same Jesus, the same Holy Spirit that led the church 2,000 years ago is leading our church and every church today. So we are looking for ways in which we can implement by the power of God's Spirit and do the very things that they did so we can continue our mission today that Jesus has given us to continue reaching the ends of the earth. So to catch you up on where we are in Acts right now, so we're in Acts 26 today to uh, give you a little bit of background on, on where we've been. Um, we've been following the journeys of the Apostle Paul. So we meet Paul back in Acts chapter 9. He is a Pharisee. Um, he is terrorizing the church because he believes that Jesus didn't rise from the dead and Jesus is a false Messiah. So he's trying to stamp out uh, the followers of Jesus. He meets Jesus and he gets his life turned around and becomes the most famous missionary, perhaps the most successful missionary uh, the world has ever seen. So instead of being a persecutor of God's church, he becomes a builder of God's church and travels around the Mediterranean area planting churches and telling people about Jesus. So eventually, Paul makes his way back to Jerusalem, where there, he has lots of enemies waiting for him. His enemies bring up trumped-up charges against him. He's arrested, and beginning in Acts 22, we find Paul kind of moving up the, the first-century legal food chain of, of Judaism and the Roman Empire. So Paul becomes a, a political pawn being bounced around uh, between these Jewish leaders that want him killed and these Roman officials that have no idea what to do with him. So we've seen Paul in front of the Jewish Sanhedrin. We've seen Paul in front of the Roman governor named Felix. And then Felix does a favor to the Jews, keeps Paul in prison, even though legally Felix wasn't allowed to do that. He does it anyway. And then Felix is succeeded by another Roman official named Festus. So Festus doesn't know what to do with Paul because Paul... Because uh, as a Roman citizen, Paul has legal rights that Festus wants to honor, but he's got these Jewish groups that want him killed. So he's between a rock and a hard place and not sure what to do with this political prisoner he has here in, his, uh, in, his, in custody. Well, Paul makes things easy for Festus by appealing to Caesar. So as a Roman citizen, if you felt like your trial wasn't going to be fairly heard at the local level, you could appeal to Caesar, the emperor, and get sent to a trial in Rome. And that's what Paul does. 
Now, Paul does this partly because he knows he won't get a fair trial there in, uh, in Judea, but he does it also because the Lord has told him he's going to testify before Caesar in Rome. So he commits himself to a, a course in which he's going to stay in custody, going all the way up the court system to Rome. So Festus is trying to figure out what to write about this because he has to write an official letter to Caesar to let him know, hey, I'm sending somebody to you. And he doesn't know what to say because there's no clear charges that have been made against Paul. So last week we saw two new characters enter the story, Agrippa and Bernice. So King Agrippa is the, uh, the official king of the Jews. He's in the line of Herod. So if you remember the name Herod from... Um, the stories of Jesus, Herod was the great evil king when Jesus was born that tried to have Jesus killed and killed every child under two years of age. So this is Herod's great grandson. All right. So he's not a good guy. Uh, He has a a Jewish heritage, um, but he knows nothing about Paul. And so Festus asks Agrippa to give him some help to figure out what to do with this guy named Paul. Um, Herod brings his sister along with him, Bernice. And last week we talked about the scandal that's going on between them. So if you want more details on that scandal, you can listen to last week's message. I want to keep things PG and not talk about what's going on between the two of them. So they're together with Festus and they agree to listen to Paul. So today we're going to hear Paul's appeal. And what Paul is going to, how Paul is going to defend himself. And as we've seen so far, Paul always doesn't, he doesn't just simply talk about his his circumstances, but he brings everything back to the resurrection of Jesus. So that everyone knows that he is on trial for his faith in Jesus. So this morning, we're going to see how it is that Paul becomes a bearer of the light of God's salvation. The light of the resurrection of Jesus that brings the world God's peace, God's reconciliation, and God's forgiveness. And Paul is called to be a proclaimer of that light, and so are we. So let's pray now as we begin our study in Acts 26. Father, we ask that now you, by the power of your Spirit, you would be leading us as we study your word together. And we ask that as we learn what it means to be a a bearer of your light, a messenger of your light, an ambassador of your light, as Paul was, that you would do that work in our hearts and in this church as well so that we could point others to you as Paul did. So be our teacher now, Holy Spirit, we ask as we study your word together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Beginning here in verse 1 of chapter 26. Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, that I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Now, Paul is going to tell his story about his background, his Jewish pharisaical background. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life and my youth spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I've lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by Jews, oh, by the Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? So again, Paul says the real issue here isn't what I did or didn't do. The real issue is this. Do you believe in resurrection? I'm here because of the hope of my people. I'm on trial because I believe exactly what the prophets say is going to pass has actually passed. Now, we need to step back for just a moment and and think along the Jewish lines that Paul is, is arguing here. Normally, when we think about resurrection, we tend to think, well, Jesus died and rose again. Someday I'm gonna die and I'll rise to be with Jesus and be in heaven with him forever. End of story. 
And in some circles, in evangelical circles, it's almost like the resurrection is an afterthought. The goal is to get to heaven and be with Jesus forever, and resurrection's the way you get there, so we have to die and we'll be raised again. Well, that's not quite what the Old Testament prophets are talking about when they talk about resurrection. That wasn't quite the, the, the focus and hope that Jews of the first century had concerning resurrection. Yes, they believed that there would be a resurrection and a final judgment at the end. But Israel's resurrection wasn't just simply, hey, I get raised from the dead so I can go be in heaven. But it was, it was a, a hope that all that the prophets had spoken of would happen. It was a national resurrection, a restoration for Israel to be the light that it was always called to be. And for all the nations of the earth to also, those who would, who would ascribe to Israel's God, would come and worship him. Those who reject Israel's God would be judged for their evil deeds that they've done against God's people. It was a, 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 a whole people being raised up into God's salvation together. It's all that the prophets had anticipated and were pointing the people towards. Let me show you one example from Isaiah chapter 60. Here's what the prophet foresees about the future restoration, the future resurrection of the people of God. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. So the prophet uses this imagery of light to talk about the national restoration, resurrection of God's people in which all will come to worship the one true God. And those that don't will be cast out into darkness. So this gives you an idea of what Paul is talking about when he's saying, why do you think it's incredible that God raises the dead? This is exactly what our prophets had been speaking about. So now he's going to continue his story in verse 9. He says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme and in raging fury against them. Notice the language that Paul is using here to describe his, his emotional state and, and his hatred against followers of Jesus and raging fury against them. I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So this is where Paul was before he met Jesus. He was a Pharisee and he was trying to stamp out this movement of Jesus' followers that he thought was a, a, a contradiction and, and, a, and a blasphemous uh, account of what true Judaism and what resurrection really was supposed to mean. So in verse 12, he tells us how he encounters Jesus. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light... Now, this word light is going to keep being repeated throughout Paul's testimony because he wants us to connect our understanding of what he's saying back to what the prophets had promised. That's the whole point of what he's trying to do is to show how this is all prophetically in line with exactly what the Old Testament spoke of. And I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. In other words, it is hard for you to resist and fight against what God is clearly doing. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So I call this Paul's uh-oh moment, right? So where he, he spent his whole life going this direction, thinking that he's doing God's will, and then all of a sudden he's told, you're not doing God's will. In fact, you're actually fighting against God. And oh, by the way, everyone that you're persecuting, you're actually persecuting your own Messiah. This is where Paul goes, uh-oh, and realizes he's the one who's been blinded. He's the one who's been in sin. He's the one who's been misled. He is the one who has misunderstood the very plan of God and the, what the prophets had always been talking about. 
Now, instead of receiving judgment and being cast out into darkness, which he probably would have uh, or should have received according to the way in which he'd been sinning against his own God and against his own tradition and against his own Messiah, look what Jesus does in verse 16. Jesus says to him, but rise, stand upon your feet. Again, this is imagery of resurrection. Paul, in standing back up, is receiving now new life from the Messiah that he hated and was trying to oppose. The Messiah is now offering him new life. Rise up on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you've seen me and to those in which I'll appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you, to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So Paul says in verse 19, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I've had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to both to our people and to the Gentiles. So Paul says, I'm in line with the prophets now. I'm in line with the hope of Israel. And it's here in this Messiah, this Jesus of Nazareth, who's been raised from the dead. And now Jesus is telling Paul, you are my chosen instrument. You are now going to be a sign of new life and resurrection. And you're going to go and proclaim my light to all the nations, both Jews and and Gentiles, and turn them from darkness to light, from the authority of Satan back to God, and that they all may receive the inheritance that I have promised to those who are faithful to me. So again, let's step back and look at this in the wider biblical picture. Paul says that he is called to proclaim light both to our people, the Jews, and to the Gentiles. What does that mean to proclaim light? Light. So we saw in Isaiah 60 how the prophets spoke about this resurrection, restoration that would happen in which the people would experience God's full light. Going back to Isaiah again, in Isaiah 42, the prophet speaks about God calling Israel as a people to be his servant and to proclaim light to the Gentiles. So as in Isaiah 42, the Lord says that he's going to call them in righteousness, take them by the hand, give them as a covenant for the people to open eyes that are blind, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, prisoners from, who sit in darkness. They're to be a, a light to the nations. However, in the intervening chapters, we find that Israel falls into idolatry. And Israel ultimately fails in their vocation to be a light to the nations. And instead, they're sent into exile, in which, that, which happened uh, during, uh, during the time in which Isaiah is prophesying, uh, prophesying about. So later on in Isaiah 49, this servant now becomes an individual. No longer the nation of Israel, they failed. Now it's an individual, and this individual is going to restore not only Israel, but also be a light to the Gentiles as well. Listen to Isaiah 49. Um, God tells through the prophet to the servant, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So how is this servant going to restore Israel and be a light to the Gentiles at the same time? Well, 
the prophet tells us in Isaiah 53, it's going to be through his own sacrificial actions. In Isaiah 53, this servant who's going to restore the tribes of Israel and bring a light to the Gentile nations will accomplish this task by offering himself as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the people. You'll see the verses up there from Isaiah 53. But I just want to look at verse 11 there where it says, Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Somehow, some way, this servant that's being prophesied in Isaiah is going to restore Israel, be a light to the Gentiles, and do it through his own sacrificial actions of somehow atoning for the sins of the people. How is this going to happen? Enter Jesus of Nazareth. Enter Jesus of Nazareth. And this is Paul's point. That which the prophets have talked about concerning the light of God coming, the salvation of God coming, the restoration of God's people, the light to the Gentiles, all of this has come through Jesus Christ, the risen Savior. So Christ fulfills Israel's commission to be a light to the nations by becoming the source of God's light through his own resurrection. And now we've seen that the resurrected Jesus now commissions Paul to extend his light and spiritually resurrect Jews and Gentiles by calling them out of darkness and back into light, by calling them away from Satan's authority back to God, by giving them the inheritance that has been promised to them, eternal fellowship with God. So, again, going back to um, verse, uh, verse 18 here, looking specifically at what Paul is going to accomplish as the light of the Savior, bringing light to the people. Spiritually blind eyes are going to be opened as the gospel of Jesus is proclaimed. People are going to be turned from darkness back to light, from Satan's authority to God's authority, and they're going to receive that promised inheritance. What is that inheritance? Well, Jesus tells us that it is a a place amongst those who are sanctified by faith in me. Translation, God's holy family who have fellowship with him. That's the inheritance, that we get God, and God has us as a family in fellowship with him through all eternity. Eyes are opened Lives are turned around to receive this free gift of the forgiveness of sins because the servant Jesus has paid that price already and we receive that inheritance of the light, of eternal fellowship with him. So Jesus fulfills the commission, gives the commission to Paul, and now we believe that commission has been given to us. It wasn't just Paul that gets the commission. Paul does get the commission, But Paul receives the commission as an example and an embodiment of what the church receives as well. So all throughout history, friends, the church follows the same commission given by Paul to proclaim light to Jew and to Gentile and turn them back to God. So here's our main idea. Like Paul... The church is commissioned to proclaim the light of Christ's resurrection to both Jews and Gentiles, opening their spiritually blind eyes, turning them from darkness to light, that they too may receive the gift of forgiveness and the promised inheritance of fellowship with God forevermore. So, let's step back again and ask a question. What does this mean for us? How do we live as ambassadors of the light? How do we share the light of resurrection with the people around us? What does this look like for us to continue the work of Jesus that was given to Paul and is now passed on to us? What does this mean for us practically? What I want to do is suggest to you, friends, that um, we are called to be allies. I'm going to use the word ally, and I use that word intentionally. I'll explain what it means in just a moment, but we're called to be an ally of the light, 
an ally of Jesus' resurrection light out, shining out to the nations. We're called to be an ally of the, of the light for both Jews and Gentiles. In other words, everybody, everywhere. So what do we mean by being an ally? In our culture right now, there's a strong emphasis on being an ally. Uh, are you an ally? Are you an advocate of whichever group is being uh, misrepresented or underrepresented or perhaps even oppressed? Our culture tends to look at all of history right now and current society through the lens of oppressors and oppress, of victimizers and victims. So here is, uh, I looked up in the Urban Dictionary, the word ally, and here's what the Urban Dictionary uh, gives us. And, and if you don't know what the Urban Dictionary is, it's not a, it's not a legit dictionary. It's, it's a cultural dictionary that gives you uh, popular cultural terms and definitions for them. So it's very helpful to understand culture, but it's not an academic definition. So if you're like, Urban Dictionary, what's that? That's just, just so you know. So here's how allyship is defined in the Urban Dictionary. It's the process of actively supporting and advocating for individuals from marginalized communities. As an, al an ally is someone who uses their position of privilege to create opportunities and advocate for people who do not have that same privilege. That's being an ally. Now, at one level, this is, uh, this is a good thing. To be an ally is a good thing. To help people who aren't able to maybe help themselves or maybe are uh, experiencing underrepresentation or maybe are being marginalized or perhaps are even being threatened. As a Christian, one of our roles is to stand up for those who aren't able to stand up for themselves, to be a voice to the voiceless. For 2,000 years, the church has always been at its best, not, not perfectly, but at its best has always been a conscience and light to whatever society that it's in. Speaking out against evil, speaking out against injustice, and standing with those who are being threatened or unjustly treated. However, in our context, to be a true ally means you must be completely and totally aligned with whatever cause you're being called to be an ally for. So there's a number of causes that are out there calling for allyship, and they set the terms of what a true ally is or isn't. And this puts Christians into a bit of a quandary because we're not to align with anybody's specific cause. We're not always to align with whatever, um, someone is, whatever terms someone may be dictating to us about what you can be an ally for and how you can be an ally and, and what the rules exactly are. Why? Because we operate with something deeper. Our allyship for people goes deeper than just simply whatever specific cause people are wanting us to join up or sign up for or advocate for. Why? Because we believe that all people are oppressed. All people have been victimized by the power of sin. And that we have a message that liberates people ultimately liberates them from the very thing that afflicts their lives. It's a deeper cause that we are committed to and a deeper cause that we are calling people to be liberated from. So we have an allyship that we have to offer the culture and the world around us and the world across the globe that, really, that, that actually results in real freedom from real captivity, the real issue that's going on in people's lives, and that is liberation from the powers of sin. So what does it mean then to be an ally of the light? Here's how Paul defines allyship, okay? So we've, we've got the Urban Dictionary definition. Here's Paul's definition. Here's Paul's definition. In Philippians 2, Paul says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights. There's that word again. Shine as lights in the world, holding fast. Some translations say holding out to the word of life. God has designed the church to be shining as a light in a dark world, 
holding fast to and holding out, extending out the very word of life that the world so desperately needs and is looking for in all the wrong places. So, practically speaking, what might this actually look like? What might this actually be? Um, for those of you that, that um, have, are part of the, the church here and you listen to my teaching on a regular basis, you know that I love missionary biographies. I love missionary stories. And I told one last week from uh, John Patton's life, and I found a couple other ones that I want to share with you because I think they, they exemplify what being an ally of the light really looks like. Advocating for people that are in really bad circumstances, but doing so in a way that points them ultimately back to Jesus and as Jesus as the solution. So, story number one. I've got two. Uh, story number one. In 1960, there was a, a young medical couple that moved to what is today the UAE, the United Arab, uh, the United, um, United Arab Emirates. Is that, did I get that right? Yeah. So, in 1960, before it actually officially become that as a nation, it was a uh, a small struggling era that uh, area that was uh, very nomadic, had villages, and wasn't uh, industrialized and modernized the way that it is today. And they came to an outlying village, this uh, this young missionary couple, and they found a, a, there was a woman there who was. Um, trying to give birth but had been, um, been, been, been sick for three days and the, the village was afraid that they're going to lose the woman and, and the baby. And this couple was able to intervene with some of their medicine and save the child and save the, the woman's life. And, 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 the, the, and the imam, the sheikh that was in power there over that village was so moved by these foreigners who were willing to risk themselves to save this, this woman's life, invited them to start a clinic there. Because at that time, the infant mortality rate in the, around that country was about 50%. So they started a clinic there, and that clinic eventually built up into a, a hospital. In fact, the sheikh who invited them to come into that village ended up becoming the founder of what today is the UAE. And the sixth child born under the care of these missionaries happens to also be the president today of that nation. And this hospital has been operated on Christian principles and has been allowed to be openly Christian in that country uh, ever since then. And today it's one of, the, one of the leading hospitals actually in the Middle East. Why? Because there was people willing to sacrifice themselves, become an ally of the people, help them, but did so in a way that would point them to Jesus. In fact, um, the woman of the, the couple, their last name is Kennedy. Her name is Miriam Kennedy. And she, um, they, they, because they didn't have a supply of blood um, in the early days, um, what would happen is the medical staff would put their own blood types on, the, you know, they'd make a list of them on the wall. And whoever needed, to, uh, needed a blood transfusion or blood of any kind, the staff themselves would offer their own blood. And Miriam ended up donating the majority of blood because of the blood type that she was. In fact, she used um, up so much of her own blood that she became anemic throughout her life and was very weak and oftentimes sick, yet continued to joyfully offer her own blood in service to people because the blood of her Savior had saved her. And she did it as a way to point people to Jesus. That's being an ally, an ally of the light, helping suffering, struggling people and doing so in a way that points them back to Jesus. Second story I'll tell you is from Brother Andrew. Some of you probably heard of Brother Andrew or maybe read uh, stories or a biography of Brother Andrew who, uh, he was a famous missionary from the Netherlands who would um, sneak into uh, communist, uh, communist Russia at the time and, and East Germany and would bring Bibles to, uh, to Christians in those communist countries. Well, after communism fell in the 1990s, he turned his attention to the Middle East and became very involved in, in the Muslim world and was trying to build connections and relationships there and get God's word to struggling Christians there in the Middle East. And he actually became um, 
friends or associates with people in high high ranking power and there's one story of uh, that one of the founding spiritual leaders of Hamas the, the terrorist group Hamas um, and this is in the early 90s before Hamas got fully radicalized I don't think this would happen today but in the early 90s before it was fully radicalized the way it is today um, that he was he was with this spiritual leader witnessing to him and he knew someone that they had put into prison and he was advocating for his friend who was in prison and said, this man has suffered enough. Let him go home to his wife and children. And Brother Andrew said, I will take his place. I'll become the prisoner. I'll finish out his sentence for him. And this, uh, you know, and this, this sheik said, well, wh why would you do that? And Brother Andrew's response was, Jesus died to set us free. Jesus died, took our place, that we could become free from the penalty of our sins and the presence of our sins so that we could be with him for eternity. And I want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus so I will give my life for the sake of this man that he may be free. For this is the way of Jesus. And the, the sheik's response to that was, I've never heard of such Christianity before. I've never heard of this kind of Christianity. I know Christians, I know what they believe, but I've never heard of anything like this. And this man, Brother Andrew's response is, this is the way of Jesus, the Messiah. See? Now, that didn't actually happen to him, but that's an example of what allyship looks like when we are willing to suffer with other people in whatever plight that they are in, but do so in a way that's not identifying so much with their cause or with whatever, whatever things they want us to align with, but do so in a way that points them back to Jesus. And when we as the church, and I believe this is one of the witnesses that we have to offer our culture right now that is so fragmented and that is so, um, so polarized and everyone's calling for this cause and that cause and this cause and that cause and, and everyone's getting pulled apart, that in the midst of this, the church can be the light and be the light by saying that we are going to a deeper cause and we're willing to suffer for that cause to point you to the real solution to the real problems, and that is Jesus Christ himself. To be an ally of the light, a true ally means to redirect people's attention to the one source of salvation that is there, and that is Christ. I want to close with a quote by one of my favorite authors, John Piper. Some of you know of uh, John Piper, famous author, uh, pastor. And he wrote a devotional book on Paul. And he summarized, I think, very correctly Paul's approach to ministry and Paul's motives for ministry. And I want you to pay particular attention to the way that love is defined here because I think this is exactly uh, what Paul what Paul means by love, because, because part of being an ally in our culture is loving someone and accepting someone. And again, this can get very confusing for Christians. What does this mean to love someone, accept someone? What, how does that, what does that look like? I think we, what we have here in this quote, I think is very Pauline, very biblical, and I want you to consider it. This is what Paul lived for, Piper writes, for the joy of his people in Christ. His whole ministry is a project of bringing others into the joy he had in knowing Jesus Christ. Love. Love means gladly embracing the quest to bring others into your experience of joy in God, in Christ, even if it costs you your life. Love is gladly embracing the quest to bring others into your experience of joy in God and Christ, even if it costs you your life. If they want to kill us, so be it. We want to bring them joy, the joy that's in Jesus. And because we believe in resurrection, we are willing to lay down our lives so that others may come to see Christ in us. That's being an ally of the light. Jesus was the most victimized, the most oppressed person who ever lived. Jesus knows injustice, victimization, and oppression in a way that, that none of us or anyone else ever fully will. And yet, Jesus, as that sacrifice, has risen again to conquer the real enemy, sin and death, so that light can come back 
for those of his people, both Jews and Gentiles, may see and be turned back to him and receive the gift that he offers us, eternal fellowship with him. And this is the message that we have to give. This is the love that we have to offer. May we be allies of the light. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would work in our hearts a deep work of your spirit to help us to be allies, not of any particular cause, but of your cause, of opening up spiritually blind eyes, bringing people out of darkness, from Satan's authority back to yours, so that they may receive the free gift that you offer us in and through Christ, which is the forgiveness of sins, and that eternal inheritance, which is everlasting fellowship with you. Let us be about this cause above all others, and let us be the kind of allies who are willing to suffer with other people, advocate for other people, but do so by pointing them to you, the one who suffered the most and is the greatest advocate that we could have, an advocate that appeals to our Heavenly Father. So Lord, would you bring to people to mind right now that you're calling us to be an ally for? Who among us is struggling? Who among us is suffering? Who's going through hard times? Who needs someone to stand with them, stand beside them? Lord, may you lead us to those people that we may point them back to you. Use our church, O oh God, as a light to the nations that others may see you clearly in us and through us. We ask this in your name. And together, God's people said, amen.